our second keynote, Vice Admiral Nora Tyson. She's a native of Memphis, Tennessee, and a graduate of Vanderbilt University. She received her commission through Officer Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island, and earned her Naval Flight Officer wings in 1983. Admiral Tyson commanded at several levels to include Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 4, Amphibious Assault Ship USS Baton, Task Force 73, Carrier Strike Group 2, and retired in 2017 following her tour as Commander, U.S. Third Fleet. Ashore, she served in several staff positions, both, joint, both Navy and Joint, overseas and stateside. Please join me in welcoming Vice Admiral Tyson. Okay. Well, it is wonderful to be here. First, I want to say Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you to, where'd you go? To my good friend, Admiral Carter and some of my other good friends, the Commandant here, who I have served with off and on over the years. Um, I have two goals today. One, I didn't pick my time to speak today, but um, this is always the most challenging time of day. One, because it's right after lunch. Two, because it's cold outside and it's warm in here. So hopefully, one of my goals is to keep you guys awake and my second goal is that hopefully you take something away from this hour-ish that you can use as you continue your journey through life. So I'm going to ask you that at the end. So I, I think this is a fabulous um, subject to base this symposium on, this inside out leadership and knowing yourself first. Um, and what I'm gonna do, I'm, I'm gonna tell you some of my thoughts on life, on leading, for what it's worth. And I'm gonna kinda go on my journey through my career and tell you some of my story and what I learned, and again, hopefully that will help you because we all know it's easier to learn from somebody else's experiences and somebody else's mistakes than it is to learn by your own mistakes, although we do learn a tremendous amount from those mistakes. So, um, so my public affairs officers who, for those of you who aren't associated with the military, they're the folks that um, help us with our interaction with the media, help us with our uh, speeches that we give, making sure we don't step all over it and say the right things and, um, and put on our, our best um, face represent the Navy uh, appropriately. So my, well, I won't say my best PAO. I've had some incredible public affairs officers. But what I, they have continually told me is, tell the audience what you're going to tell them in the beginning, and then in the end, tell them what you told them. So I'm going to do that. And group everything in threes, because it's much easier to remember those things. And I don't know if it's for me to remember or you to remember, but I'm kind of going to do that. And I'm kind of going to put my glasses on. <laughs> so, here are three questions that I want you to think about as we talk. And I'm going to talk for a while, and then I want to open it up for questions, and you guys just fire anything you want to at me. But here's the three questions. One, what are your values and why? And we get values throughout our life from different people, from our parents, uh, from our teachers, from our friends, um, from professors. And then the, the follow-on question, that this is still part of part question one, is how do you instill those values 
in those that you are leading, okay? Number two, who are your role models and why? And then are you a role model? And are you the kind of person that other, one, other people want to grow up and be? Whether it's your siblings, whether it's people who work for you, when you look in the mirror, can you honestly say, yeah, I'm the kind of person that other people want to be? Three is what do you want your legacy to be? So I had the distinct honor about six weeks ago to be an honorary pallbearer for President Bush. And that was because I was the strike group commander of the George H.W. Bush. The honorary pallbearers were the former and current commanding officers of the USS George H.W. Bush and the strike group commanders. So during the time that week when we were honoring President Bush, one of the things that struck me was at some point he was asked, what do you want your legacy to be? And he paused for a moment, and, and most of you know, hopefully all of you know, that he was a Navy pilot. He said, duty, honor, country. And he said, if I have to pick one, it would be honor. So think about that while we're talking over the next few minutes. What do you want your legacy to be? And since I'm the one talking and not the PAO, I have a fourth question. <laughs> Don't tell. So we talk a lot about diversity. And I've talked a lot about diversity. And I think that diversity is an incredibly um, important concept. And it's because, and, and when I was, I don't know, maybe a captain several years ago, was when we were really in, in the Navy talking about diversity and how we got more diverse. This is after things opened up for women, but you know, we're primarily white males and how do we um, look different? How do we um, better represent the demographics of our country? So, so my question is this. So diversity is important because of our different backgrounds, our different education, our different ethnicities, our different ways of thinking between male and female because we know we're wired differently. What do you bring to the table? And that's what diversity is about. It's about bringing different ways of thinking to the table, to the organization, to the team. So my question is, what do you bring to the table and how do you help your team, whatever it may be, your organization, how do you help that team succeed in its tasking, in its mission? And how does what you bring to the table, how does that support others and what they bring to the table? Okay, so those are the, I'll call it three and a half questions, I'm not cheating too much. And now there's three words that I want you to remember that I think are the most important words, and they're interrelated, but to being a successful leader, to being a successful team player. And that is relationships, trust, and honor, okay? Now what I call this speech 
this conversation we're about to have is my lessons on living and leading. And again, hopefully you can glean something from it and take away something that, or subtract something that you are going to learn from the School of Hard Knocks. So what is leadership? And this is, again, this is all my opinion. It has nothing um, to do with Navy policy, obviously, um, strictly my opinion. It's not the person and it's not the title. So it's not about having the big corner office, it's not about being the CEO, it's not about being the admiral or being the commanding officer. It's about serving others. It's about solving problems. It's about unlocking potential, both yours and other members of the team. It's about giving opportunity to others. It's about growing others. It's about being the communicator. And I'll get into this a little bit in my experience. But what I have found is as a leader, you have to be a communicator. You have to be the one who is giving that team, whether it's a, a ship or a SEAL team or an organization or a project team or whatever it is, you are the one that communicates the mission, the tasking, and lets that team know why they are there and what is expected of them. And you're the decision maker and you're the team leader. So as a decision maker, here's, here's what I learned. Bottom line is do the right thing. Now, when you're facing tough decisions, Doing the right thing sounds pretty simple, but it just, it's taking into account all of the resources that you have available to you. It's using that diversity you have on the team. It's absorbing all the input that you possibly can to make the right decision. Many times in my career, I was asked, so what is the hardest thing about what you do? And my answer was always, you know, the tactical stuff, the ship driving, the, the airplane flying, you can learn that. The hardest part about what I do what I did in my career, again, in my opinion, was making decisions that affect other people's lives. And in making those decisions, I tried my hardest to take all the information I had available to me, talking to, if it was doing captain's mast on a ship, it was, taking input from an end. So captain's mass, for those of you who don't know, that's when somebody gets into some disciplinary problem and they end up before the commanding officer. And the commanding officer is the adjudicator of um, punishment, if you will. So, in making those decisions, which ultimately could be kicking somebody out of the military, it could be taking money away from them, it could be putting them in the brig on bread and water for three days, any range of, of things. Two, you know, not guilty, go back and, you know, I don't prefer not to see you in this forum again. But you got to make sure that you are taking all the information available to you, that individual's supervisors, their input, the um, input of their peers, reading through their service record, as much information that you can get on this individual 
to make the right decision. And after you make that decision, to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I did the right thing for the right reason, and then you know, move on. So as, as that decision maker, doing the right thing, being educated, being as informed as you can be, using all your resources, listening, that is one of what I have found is one of the hardest things to do. And as you get more senior and uh, I'll say more mature, in some organizations probably more than others, but people tend to, um, uh, people at the top may or may not be good listeners because when they get into positions of leadership, people, believe it or not, you have people in the world who are considered yes people. And if the boss says it, it's gotta be true and it's gotta be right. So back to diversity, I think as a good leader, it is essential that you respect that diversity and listen to those people at the table who have different ways of thinking. Again, it may be because they grew up in another country or a different environment. They have a different education. You know, we talk about STEM, 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 which is great. I am all about that, but I was an English major. And so I, I prefer STEAM which pulls in that arts and sciences kind of stuff. Um, because I firmly believe those of us who have liberal arts backgrounds think differently than those who have more technical backgrounds or educations or training. And I think that we use different lobes of our brain and all that stuff, but I think it's important that we respect that and that we say, okay, so what do you think about this? So again, it's back to listening and respecting uh, and appreciating those diverse thoughts that are brought to the team. Again, the team, a team by definition, whether it's an athletic team, a, uh, again, a project team, a ship, a squadron, uh, whatever it is, it's made up of individuals. And again, diverse individuals who bring something different to the table. And it's built on trust. And it doesn't matter, again, what kind of team it is, but I defy you to come up with a team that is not built on trust and respect. And then it's about relationships within that team. You know, whether you're a center and a quarterback, the quarterback trusts the center to hike the ball to him or her, I suppose. Um, you generally trust the kicker to kick the ball where it's supposed to go. That doesn't always happen, as we know. But you know what I'm talking about. It's relationships, it's trust. And it's generally a common cause, a common mission. Okay, so here, here are my, kind of my rules before I get into how I got there in my history. And it's back to the, to the um, theme of this conference, be yourself. I have seen too many people in my lifetime who try to be something that they're not. And it's, it's hard to keep up that persona and try to be something that you're not. You've got to be true to yourself. You've got to know yourself. Love what you do. And as a leader, I think that is particularly important because those that you lead need to see that you enjoy what you do, that you love what you do, that you are smiling when you come to work, and that you genuinely enjoy what you do. Now, I got it. Sometimes we get stuck in jobs and positions that, 
um, is not exactly where we envisioned ourselves. It's not where we particularly want to be at that time. But what I've found is if, if somebody says, hey, you're going to be assigned the dumpster officer, you be the best daggum dumpster officer you can be. And you know what? People are going to acknowledge that. They're going to see that you were given a job and you did it to the best of your ability. And you know what? That's going to open doors. They're going to go, well, because he was the best dumpster officer, I think we can give him this job in a leadership position because he has proven that he can, he can do the job when we ask him to do the job. And you smile when you take care of that dumpster and you have the shiniest dumpster around. And you know what? The opportunities are just going to be there for the asking. So again, do your best. Love what you do. And whatever it is you're doing at the time, be the best that you can be. Again, listen and learn. You're going to learn from people. And, and I, I got to tell you, I think listening is one of the hardest things that we do because we have limited time and we know where we're going to go. We know sometimes you know what that decision is going to be. You know the decision you're going to make and you just go, yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Round the table, yep, 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 want to hear, want to hear and you're not listening to anything, and, and you've already made the decision. So I, I encourage you to listen and to learn from those around you because it's incredible what you're gonna learn. None of us know it all. I mean, when we die, we're not gonna know it all. So seek to learn as much as you can every day. Don't go to bed at night unless you've learned something. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. That's a hard one, too. Take the time to go, okay, if I were on the receiving end of this conversation, what would motivate me? What would make me want to follow this person off the face of the earth and do anything for them? And that gets back to the role model question. You... You need to be, figure out what your values are, and they may change over time, but you gotta be true to yourself and you wanna be that role model. You want people to want to be you. Okay. And hopefully, as those of you in the audience, and I'm not pointing at anybody's slap shot, but hopefully as we mature in life, we realize that it's less about me and it's more about those who are coming behind us. So in the continuum of life, you, and most of the people in the audience, you guys are, are students, either here or, or another military institution or uh, civilian institution, and you guys are the future. And right now, it, it, a lot of it is about you and studying and making good grades so that you can go to flight school or go to nuclear power school or go to graduate school, or to med school, or whatever it is that you've got your sight set on right now, it's important that you study and you make the grades. And then, as you go on to the next step, it may still be about grades, whether it's in flight school or nuclear power school or wherever it is. But as you move on in life and you you achieve those, inter, I'll call them intermediate goals, it becomes more about the team and those coming behind us. So for me, as I got more senior in the Navy, I really came to realize it is all about those coming behind me. It is all about giving them the opportunity to succeed. 
and whether it is the youngest sailor on the deck plate of a ship or a submarine or in the squadron, making sure that they have the tools that they need, that they have the training that they need, that they have the support that they need. And of course, as you get more senior, it's about the family support and making sure that we are providing those families that we leave behind when we deploy, that they have what they need to, to live life while we're gone for six months or seven months or a year or however long that we're gone so that they can succeed, so that their children can succeed in school, so that the spouses can, can continue in his or her career and do what they need to do to succeed in life. So again, I understand where we are, where, where different people in this room are in different places on this continuum of life. So how did I get here? And what is my story and what did I learn along the way about these three and a half questions and these three words and why I think they're important. So I, I came in the Navy accidentally. It, it was mentioned, I went to Vanderbilt, I took the LSATs, I was going to go to law school. And I went home to Memphis, and a couple of weeks later, I got a call from the Navy recruiter who said, hey, we got your name and number. How about coming down here and talking to us? And I said, what? What are you talking about? And I thought, well, you know, I got nothing better to do, so okay. So I go down to the recruiting office, and they said, well, you know, why don't you take this test? This little, we'll see what you have an aptitude for. And I said, yeah, okay, whatever. And then they go, well, you know, why don't, why don't we just do, you know, this physical stuff and get it out of the way? And I said, yeah, okay, I hadn't signed up for anything, so all right. So I, so I did, and um, so I go home, and a few weeks later I get this call, hey, you got accepted. And I go, huh? <laughs> accepted to what? And they said, oh, well, you got accepted to officer candidate school. And I said, really? And they go, you weren't waiting for our call? And I said, mm -mm, no. <laughs> and they said, well, this is highly unusual. This, I mean, it's such an honor. And I go, okay, okay. <laughs> and I said, can I call you back? And they said, well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so, so I hung up and I thought about it. And, um, and my dad had been in the Tennessee Air National Guard, and he had come and gone in flight suits, and I guess I thought that was kind of cool. And, but I, I never had any thought of going in the military. So ultimately, I said, well, you know, if I don't, I'll always wonder what would happen if I had and what's four years, which was a commitment. This was, no one said a word about ships, no one said a word about aviation, and so I was going in as a general unrestricted line officer, which I don't think anybody does that anymore. But back then, this was before the laws changed and, and it was very restricted for women. So I, I didn't know any better. I go, yeah, okay, whatever. And, I, and so off I go to Newport, Rhode Island in officer candidate school. And I didn't know what I was getting into. I took my racquetball racket. I thought I was going to a country club or something. <laughs> But I loved it, I really did. And, uh, and I'd never been that far north either. And it was, um, and it was cold. I got there in uh, August and was commissioned in December. And it, I mean, it was frigid. And we had these little paper thin little uniforms and we're out there marching on whatever it is that you march on up there. And, uh, and, I, and I really enjoyed it and made some great friends, and then the time came for us to make the decision on where we wanted to, to go for our first tour. So they had this list of, you name it, all over the world, Midway Island, or Guam, or San Diego, or wherever. And I said, you yeah, know, can, can I go to DC? And they're like, well, yeah. And I said, 
I had got a bunch of college buddies in D.C., so can I, can I go there? So I ended up going to Washington, D.C., and, uh, and lived with a bunch of Vanderbilt buddies in Old Town, Alexandria, and we just had a great time. <laughs> and I learned a tremendous amount, I have to tell you, because um, I... I <laughs> I gotta tell you what my job was. I was a special services officer for Naval District Washington. So that means that I was responsible for the tennis courts, the swimming pools, the people that hand out no kidding, the basketballs and the volleyball. Oh, somebody's gotta do it. So that was, that was my job. And I worked for a commander who was a, had been a pilot. He flew A7s uh, and you only see those in museums now. And then the Admiral in Naval District Washington was a, a P-3 pilot. Of course, you know, pretty much all our P-3s are gone now. And then the next Admiral was an F-14 guy, and you know, they were pretty much gone too. So, um, but that's irrelevant. But anyway, these aviators said, hey, you need to apply for flight school or you won't stay in. And I said, hmm, okay. Because, I, I mean, nobody had ever brought up that option. So I applied for flight school and I got accepted to flight school. So opportunity presented itself, door opened, and I said, oh, okay, why not? So I got accepted to flight school. I went to Pensacola. Uh, I got to Pensacola and, and those of you who are Navy folks or Air Force folks or have any aviation in your blood, um, you know that there's certain requirements for pilots. So I got down there and I passed the physical before I got there and they said, well, you got 2025 in your right eye. You can't be a pilot. And I said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, do I go back to doing what I was doing before? Do I go back to DC and hand out volleyballs? And they said, no, you don't do that. I said, okay. And, and I said, so do I get out? And, you know, um, maybe I'll go to law school. And they said, no, can't do that. And I said, okay. I said, so, so what do I do? And they said, well, you can be an NFO. And I said, oh, well, okay. Sounds like that's the only option. What exactly is an NFO? And they said, well, you fly, you're just not the pilot. You're like the mission person. And I go, well, sounds like that's the only option, so I guess that's what I'll do. <laughs> so I became a naval flight officer. And, and again, it was about opportunity. So one door closed, being a pilot, another door open, being an NFO, although that was the only door that was open at the time. And I said, okay, well, I guess I'll go be an NFO, and I'll be the best daggum NFO that ever lived, besides Ted Carter. <laughs> So, so what, you know, so you go to flight school, and again, it's about you, and it's about, one, getting through water survival, which is tons of fun, and it's about the obstacle course, which is tons of fun, and it's about learning your trade. It's about learning how to navigate or learning how to be a weapon systems officer or learning how to fly an airplane or, you know, whatever else, again, whether it's new power school or, or the basic school or whatever it is, you're, you're going to go and you're going to give it all you've got and you're going to try to be the best daggum whatever it is. So then from, from flight school, I went to the squadron, and there, at the time I got my, my naval flight officer wings, there were only six squadrons in the Navy that women could go to because this was before the laws had changed and opened up pretty much everything to women. So I ended up uh, at a squadron in Patuxent River, Maryland. It's uh, now in Oklahoma. It's Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 4. And we were a strategic communications platform, uh, EC-130s at the time. 
And I found out I just really loved the heck out of doing this. And I loved, we had a, a crew of about, depending on how many trainees you had, 15 to 18 typically. And we'd take off and we'd fly around the world and we'd do our mission and we'd be gone for, I don't know, two or three weeks. And, and sometimes you'd have a, a very junior lieutenant or even a lieutenant JG that had been in the Navy for three or four years as the mission commander for that crew to go out and do the mission and do what's expected and lead that crew and come back and to the squadron and say, you know, we did what we were supposed to do. And, and I really found that I loved what I was doing. I loved flying. I love the team, I love the leadership opportunity that, you know, at a, at a pretty young age, you know, I was probably 25 at the time, and I, I just said, you know, this is a lot of fun. I didn't know if I was going to stay in forever, but I said, you know, I'm going to enjoy it while I'm here and make the most of every day. So, uh, from there I went to... Uh, teaching the naval flight officers that were going in to that particular mission. So I was on what we called shore duty for a couple of years and I was writing courses and I was teaching young folks who were going to the squadron for the first time, the mission and the equipment and all that kind of stuff. So that was fine. Uh, but then I got, I got tired of that and I wanted to go fly again. I wanted to get out there and be on the front line and flying and having more fun than I was having sitting behind a desk. So I, I called the detailer and I said, hey, you know, can you send me back to the squadron? And they said, no, the squadrons are over man. And I go, huh, okay, so again, huh, what can I do? And they said, hey, how about Lexington? And I go, Lexington, isn't that a ship? Well, yeah. And I said, well, okay. So at the time, Lexington was an old Essex-class carrier that had, you know, been through World War II, the Korean War, and, and she, she'd had kamikaze hits, and she, she'd been through a lot. And she was our training carrier down in Pensacola at the time, and that's where all the pilots got their initial carrier quals. And it was the only ship that female aviators could go to at the time. Because again, very few ships for women surface warfare officers, one ship that female aviators could go to. So I said, yeah, okay. So we head off down to Pensacola and I found out I loved going to sea. And I loved driving ships. And I, I just had a ball. And I worked for some, some great naval officers, commanding officers of the ship. The, the navigator was a great guy. The XO, great guy. Uh, we had a couple of crazy folks, but th that's, you're going to find that everywhere. But some great role models and some great mentors. Some, some great surface warfare officers that taught me the steam plant and engineering and what makes a ship tick. Some great surface warfare officers and, and aviators who taught me how to drive a ship and what this carrier qualification thing was all about and what you needed to do to get the ship into the wind and situated so that the planes could land and do what we do. And I, I just found that I, I thought that was so much fun. So at that, during that tour, I said, hey, if things ever open up for women, I want to be a navigator on an aircraft carrier, never thinking that that opportunity would present itself. And, oh, by the way, Navigators on aircraft carriers are post-command aviators. Well, never in a million years did I think I would get command of a squadron. So I leave Lexington and I went back to the squadron to fly and, and do my department head tours. So you're in more of a leadership role. You're expected to go back in, get your qualifications in, in the aircraft. Do that, be a leader, be a leader out there on the front line, be a leader in the squadron, 
as a department head. So I went back um, and I did that and there were some interesting challenges, uh, some interesting leadership challenges that I really, and, and again, I, I say you learn something every day. You learn good and you learn bad, unfortunately. And you're going to come across people in your life, and I'm sure everybody in this audience has at one time or another, come across people that um, are not particularly your role models, if you know what I'm saying. And so you, you learn from that. You take out your little green book or your little spiral notebook and you go, I do not want to have these traits. But you learn and there are people out there that, that you go, I would not follow that person off the face of the earth and I do not particularly want to be like that person when I grow up. But anyway, I learned and, and I will say I persevered and, and came out floating on top of the water and not drowning. So I go off to, to Naval War College, which was another incredible experience. And at that time, um, the Navy was not known for um, filling its seats at the Naval War College. And we got better over time, and I think we're doing good now. But it was, it was not the most desirable thing in people's careers, quite frankly, because you wanted to stay in the cockpit, you wanted to stay operational, you wanted to stay out there, because it, it was fun, for one thing. But I went to Naval War College, and that really opened my eyes to, during the, my department head tour, I, I had really worked hard I'd flown a lot, and I just was head down getting the job done. I didn't read the newspaper. I didn't know what was going on in the world. I was, I was in a cocoon. And I got to the Naval War College, and, and the blinders came off, and I learned a tremendous amount. And it was, it was a great opportunity because you're there for anywhere from nine months to a year. And, and you're in a learning environment. And you're with your peers from, um, really, from all the services. We've got folks from uh, other parts of the government. We've got some State Department folks. We've got people from other countries, and it is an opportunity to learn, to learn from those around you, to learn about the other services, to learn about other countries, to learn about other people and what makes them tick. And again, the listening, the diversity thing, you know, there's an incredible world out there, and I just went, wow, this is, this is pretty neat. And I started reading the newspaper, and I became interested in, like, the Paul Mill world and was just fascinated. And lo and behold, while I was there, I screened for command, which I just went, oh, my God. And in the meantime, the law had changed, opening things up for women. And so I immediately called the detailer and I said, well, hey, I screened for command, believe it or not. And I said, assuming I have a successful command tour, I want to be navigator on an aircraft carrier. And he said, you want to what? Yeah, huh? And he, he goes, well, because no woman had done that. And, and I said, well, you know, I got my officer of the deck qual. I learned how to drive ships. I drove an aircraft carrier, I got it, it's not a, a big straight stick go to war aircraft carrier, but it, it was the best I could do. You know, it was Lexington, it was a training carrier, a little smaller, a little, you know, not as wide. But, but um, so ultimately he calls and he goes, hey, okay, how about Enterprise? And, um, and I go, well, What's she doing? Because you don't want to be navigator of a ship that's going to be in the shipyard the whole time you're there. That's not a real challenge. I mean, it's a challenge, but in other ways. There's not a lot of navigating to do. So they said, you would get there right as they're starting workups to go on deployment. You take her on deployment. You know, and I go, okay, sign me up. I'm in. 
So I, so I did. And it, it was just an incredible experience. Great, great crew. Um, it went around the world. Went, it challenges unlike I had ever dreamed of. But incredible team. And I, I worked for a guy that is one of those that you stand back and you go, you know, I would follow that guy off a cliff any day of the week. And my assistant navigator and I would stand there and, and watch him operate. Whether it was driving a ship, he was an incredible, he was an F-14 guy. But he, he was an incredible ship driver. Had, had great eye, you know, relative distance and movement and all that stuff. And he was just an incredible leader. There were times when he could have just shot people between the eyes and thrown them overboard. And he would say, so, what are we gonna do to make sure this doesn't happen again? And we would just go, wow, I wanna be that guy. And that's, and that's what you learn. And that's when, when you say, I, I wanna be a role model like that leader. And it was, it was just, um, it was an incredible opportunity. And, and he said, hey, so what do you want to do next? And I said, I, you know, I don't know. This is kind of as far as my, my dreams went, is being navigator. So I, yeah, I don't know. I'll go do a fellowship, go somewhere and some think tank and think big thoughts and, you know, things like that. He goes, no, 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 I think you need to go do something joint that's going to give you um, opportunity. It's going to keep doors open. And, and I go, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. So, so ultimately, I, I did go to a joint job. But I want to get back to this commanding officer thing. So I had the opportunity to be the commanding officer of a squadron. And I had the opportunity to be the commanding officer of, of a ship. And, and it's just, it's, it's indescribable, quite frankly. And when people say, so what, what was the best tour of your career? The Commandant and I just talked about this. It, it unquestionably was being the commanding officer of a ship because you go to sea and, and it's, it's your responsibility. And you're sitting in that chair on the bridge. And in my case, we had about 1,200 sailors and, and about 1,900 Marines on board. And, and you take off over the horizon and it's your responsibility and you're accountable for everything on that ship. And, and it was, it was, just an incredible experience. But what I learned back to the questions and the words, um, communication was huge. When I had command of Bataan, we had gone to the Persian Gulf a couple of times. Um, it was a very busy, and I was there about three years, it was a very busy time. And the tasking changed almost daily. And I learned that if you want people to follow you, and if you want people to work their hardest for you, for the Navy, for that ship, for that organization, you got to give them what they need. And that, in, in my case, I found that communicating every day and more, if you had to, to tell every member of that team what we were doing, what I knew, what I didn't know, was critical to our success. We ended up going down and doing an exercise off of Panama. And I think we had, uh, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 20 uh, Latin American countries that were a part of that exercise. 
And, and that was an incredible experience, back to relationships, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But every opportunity that we have to build relationships with our partners around the world, with our partner services, with our partner agencies, State Department, you know, USAID, the, all of those agencies that we are all a part of that synergy, a part of the whole that makes the whole system work. And, and on the way back from this exercise, we, uh, we pulled in to Texas and dropped off some uh, mine sweeping equipment, helicopters, some sleds that the helicopters pull behind them. And as we got underway and we crossed the, the sea buoy going back into the Gulf of Mexico, I got a call from my boss that said, hey, Nora, um, could you take those helicopters back on board that you just dropped off and make your way over um, to New Orleans? You know, go up here and, and do circles in the water take those helicopters back on board, and as the seas died down, well, it was Katrina. And it, we were the first ship on scene, after, well, we were down south of New Orleans when the levee broke, and it, it was incredible. It was sheer chaos. As most people know by now, it's in the history books. But I learned a tremendous amount and it won back to communication. It, it, we did everything that we could do. We launched helicopters. We launched whatever landing craft we had in the well deck. And we just said, go, go do whatever you can do. Go help people. You know, and they were picking people up off of roofs and dropping them up at the cloverleaf up at I-10. I mean, it was just, it was, it was unbelievable. It was surreal. But we had, um, are there any Mexicans here? Yes, okay, excellent. So I was somewhere on the ship and I got a call, hey, the, there, you got a call from the embassy in Mexico, our embassy. And I go, okay, so I get on the phone and it was the naval attache in our um, embassy. And he said, what, what are you doing about the Mexicans? And I go, what, huh? What, what are you talking about? And he goes, the Mexicans. The, the Mexican Navy has a ship on its way up there and nobody's talked to them. And I go, okay. And uh, so I called my Navy friends who were now over in New Orleans now, I go, hey, do you guys know there's a Mexican ship on its way up here? And they go, no. And I go, well, I just got this call from the embassy in Mexico, and they said, there's a ship on its way. I said, so what do you want me to do? They go, just handle it. I go, oh, okay. So I put, I had some Spanish speakers on the ship, and I put them on a the bridge that night and said, you guys stay up here all night and try to hail the Mexican ship on its way. And, and it was Papaloapan for my Mexican friends out there. And the next morning, lo and behold, we had a Mexican ship beside us. And the previous day, uh, the Dutch had ships down in Curacao and a Dutch frigate showed up. And, and so I brought the leadership from the CO of the Dutch ship and the Mexican ship had several admirals on board and they all came over to the ship and we sat down and said, okay, you know, what can we do? What capabilities do you have? What do you have? What can we do? How do we work this together? And then four, we got Canadians out there. No Canadians? Well, four Canadian ships showed up and, and so we just did everything that we could do and we took landing craft and we took sailors from all of those ships and we 
took them in to the beach and, and they helped clean up and do whatever we could do to help our fellow countrymen. And it was just an incredible experience. But I go back to relationships and how important those relationships are and, and building relationships at every stage in your career because you will be surprised as you continue in life how you continue to cross paths and I don't care what your calling in life is. The world gets smaller, even though the world gets bigger, we all know that, the world gets smaller as you continue on life's journey and you will be surprised if you take the time to nurture those relationships, build trust, with honor, we're, we're all going to make the world a better place. And I know that's big thoughts and big speak, but um, so, it, and it wasn't just the Katrina part and building relationships with those three other countries. It was, I, got, I know I got Marines out there. I learned something when I went to an amphibious ship, which I had never served on an amphib before. But I learned that, God, I love Marines. But I learned that, that Marines don't forget history. And they, I won't say hold grudges, but... There was this thing a while back called Guadalcanal. Where are my Marines? Yeah, okay. So we, we go over for Operation Iraqi Freedom One, and, and we took all these Marines, and we put them on the beach. And they went into Kuwait and worked their way up into Iraq. And they said, are you, are you going to be here when we come back? because you, know, you remember Guadalcanal. And I'm like, yeah, we're gonna be here. But I'll tell you what, in going over to a situation that we were going over to, not knowing what the outcome was gonna be, not knowing exactly what we were, were getting into, there were relationships built between the sailors on that ship and the Marines on that ship that I have never seen anything like it. And I have been told in going to that ship, oh my God, oh my God, you're gonna have to have blue-green chow lines, and you're gonna have to have blue-green gym hours, and you're gonna have to this, that, and the other, because oh, you know, the sailors and the Marines, they're gonna get in fights, and they're gonna, you know, throw food at each other, and blah, blah, blah. None of that, none of that. One of the most moving experiences of my career was when those Marines came back, thank you very much, and they had not showered for a long time. God bless them. And we brought as many as could fit onto one of our landing craft, which was, I don't know, a couple of hundred of them at a time, and they floated in to the well deck and sailors came from all over and they'd been gone for um, six months. And sailors, I think they'd taken more than one shower maybe in those six months. Didn't smell like it, but, but the sailors walked down into the well deck, into the water, went out there, took those Marines packs, carried them on board, and it, it was one of the most moving experiences of my life because it was just, it, it was eye-watering. And we said, take, take all your clothes off, you know, put your skivvies, gym clothes, whatever you want to on. We'll do all your laundry. We're going to have steak and lobster and whatever you want to eat. Eat as much as you can eat. Sleep as much as you can sleep, which Marines do on a ship anyway, but... And they work out and they shoot their guns. But it was, it was a beautiful thing. And it was about relationships and trust. And us saying, we're going to be, we got your back. We're going to be here when you come back. And we were. 
And, and it's building that trust, and of course it's, it's, it was all about honor, but I won't get into that anymore. But um, back to being a leader, and what I learned on the ship about being a role model. People are watching you. They are watching you, whether it's, you know, as a junior officer, as the youngest person on the team, you will be surprised the cues that people take from you. So when I walked around that ship or walked around that squadron as the commanding officer or executive officer or somebody in a leadership position, I did not walk past a piece of trash without picking it up. Because if you walk past a piece of trash, a, a gum wrapper or whatever, that means it's okay to not pick up trash. And if everybody on that ship or in that organization goes, well, boss didn't pick up trash, so I don't have to pick up trash, what do you think that that organization, that building, that ship, that squad, what do you think it's going to look like? Oh, my God. And it, and it's, it really is amazing as the years went on and I got further away from a particular job and a particular tour that I would run into people who said, I remember you. And I'd be at a gas station in, you know, shorts, and they go, I remember you. You were the XO of Baton on cruise, you know, six years ago. And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I was. How you doing? And it, you just don't know who's watching and who is looking up to you as a role model. So think about that in everything that you do. It may be your siblings, it may be your children, it may be those people that work for you, it may be somebody you have never met before that is looking at you as a role model. And the last thing you wanna do is let them down and fall off that pedestal that, for whatever reason, they have put you on. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to another great experience that we had, and when I never dreaming in a million years that I would make lieutenant commander, lo and behold, I made admiral. And my first job was um, to be the task force commander in Singapore. Well, I didn't know where Singapore was. I didn't know that we had Navy in Singapore. But we took off and flew around the world to Singapore. Any Singaporeans out there? Yes. How are you? Good. We loved it. We absolutely loved it. I had been East Coast most of my career, flying tours, ship tours, and, um, and we went to Singapore with open eyes, open minds, and it was an incredible experience. So what we, what we do in Singapore is we have the um, logistics command for 7th Fleet. And 7th Fleet is our fleet in Japan that theoretically covers everything from the international date line to the dividing line between India and Pakistan. And we were responsible for ensuring that the Navy assets out in 7th Fleet had what they needed. So we had the oilers, the ammunition ships, the supply ships, to make sure that everybody had the logistics stuff that they needed to do their job. 
Another part of our job was to, um, to run the bilateral Navy to Navy exercises with all the countries in Southeast Asia. So Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Brunei, Cambodia, Bangladesh, I'm leaving somebody out. But anyway, and it, again, I had not spent any time, any, in that part of the world, and, and neither had Wayne, my husband, who's sitting down here on the front row. Um, and we learned so much from that tour. It, it was about history, it was about culture, it was about people, it was about relationships because historically speaking, there are all sorts of fascinating relationships going on out in Southeast Asia. Um, and it was just an incredible experience. And I had the opportunity to work with, with my counterparts, the leadership of the navies in all those countries and often the other services because the exercises that we did and we we did these exercises on an annual basis and did uh, planning conferences that took me to these countries and interacting uh, with the leadership um, typically three or four times a year so i got to to most of those countries about a dozen times in three years and got to know my counterparts pretty well and build relationships and build relationships on trust. And when I would speak with my superiors and in that job you had about four different bosses and when any of my bosses said, hey Nora, what do you want to do next? I said, well, silly you should ask, but of course I want to go back to sea. And that being said, I think that this tour should be longer. It, sh it was typically a two-year tour, and I said, I think it should be a three-year tour because it's, it's all about relationships, and it's all about building trust. And, and it's in the world that we live in, I think that's incredibly important because the world is a fascinating place, as you guys know, and things are changing every day, politically, demographically. Uh, it's just, the, it's fascinating. And none of us can go it alone. And the better we know each other and the better we understand each other, I think the better place the world is going to be. And I have continued to say that. Um, really, it was driven home to me during that tour in Singapore because I did learn so much from the, these folks that, that I just never had the opportunity to meet before, to get to know before, to learn from. And, and I took that with, I did get, oh, by the way, I got to stay in that job for three years and uh, we took advantage of that opportunity. We traveled a lot, I, both with the job and then we took every opportunity that we could to travel on our own. And we got to Laos and we got to Vietnam and we got to Australia and New Zealand. Um, if you've ever heard of uh, Pacific Partnership, which is a, anybody been on Pacific Partnership? Okay. We have, the Navy has two hospital ships, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. And that ship or another ship will every other year um, go out and do humanitarian assistance around the, in this case, around the Pacific. We've also sent 
our East Coast ship down around Latin America to work with partner nations, partner agencies, uh, Doctors Without Borders, Operation Smile. Yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. And I had the opportunity to meet up with um, Mercy in both Papua New Guinea and Cambodia while I was in the Singapore job. And it was another one of those eye-opening experiences where you, where I got to see things that I had just never dreamed of before in my life. For instance, in Papua New Guinea, um, we had, I say we, collectively we had this clinic that was in this old church with a dirt floor and we had, I don't know how many partner nations were with us, but specifically that day, I remember a Canadian and a Korean and an American working together in the dental area. And I had the, the opportunity to talk to some of the docs and, and I said, and, and first of all, it, it was just, it was amazing because they would have the patient, in this case dental, sitting in one of those little plastic patio chairs and they were just yanking teeth out of their heads and, and just throwing them in these little like Dixie cups. And, and it, it was incredible. Well, is there anybody here from Papua New Guinea? Raise your hand, yell. Okay. And anybody been to Papua New Guinea? Raise your hand, yell. Okay. So, um, fascinating place. I'm told there's still cannibals there. But they, they chew betel nut. And it, and it rot, it's kind of a... Uh, Uh, anesthesia, kind of? Are you telling me to wrap it up? Thanks. <laughs> but anyway, the bottom line was they had the highest pain threshold of any, anybody, any of these docs had ever seen. And I go, well, why is that? Because they're just yanking all these teeth out of their head. No anesthesia, no nothing. And they're just, you know, kind of, okay. And they said, because domestic violence, they just, you know, it's what they do. It's their culture. And you just go, wow, that's incredible. And then the surgeon said, um, I said, so what are you, are you learning anything from these docs? And he said, oh, my God, yes. And I said, well, what are you learning? Because, you know, they got all this technology on the ship. It's just incredible. And he goes, we got all this technology, and they don't. And they're performing the same procedures we are without this technology. So, oh, my God, when I'm learning from them, and you just go, wow, I never thought of that. So, anyway, I, I will stop in a minute and open it up for questions, and you guys just drag me off when you want me to stop. <laughs> um, but... Again, I go back to, it's all about relationships. When I was strike group commander on the George H.W. Bush, it was about people like the Commandant, who was the des not on my strike group, but when I was third fleet commander, he was on Stennis as the Desron commander. It's about those relationships between the warfare commanders and they're doing their job and complimenting each other and empowering each other and as the strike group commander knowing that those individuals know their job, know their people and when you give them the mission they're going to get the job done because they're going to work together and they built those relationships and it was just eye-watering because and I remember sitting at lunch with you guys and Rob's roommate from the Naval Academy was the air wing commander. And I'll tell you what, when you got those two guys as best friends and knowing each other the way they know, that is the key to success. 
It's about relationships, it's about trust, and it's, it's about honor. So again, think about those questions as you go on throughout life and throughout your career. Think about what your values are and why, who your role models are and who you're a role model for and why, and are you the person you want to be? And then thinking about the diversity piece and what you bring to the table and what you want your legacy to be when you move on. So my question for you is, you've had an opportunity to witness firsthand uh, women in the military. And I want to ask you, you know, one of the things that was keeping, you know, we talk a lot about diversity and we talk a lot about values. And I'm curious to know your understanding of, do you think early on the military had the wrong values, which is why so many women, women initially weren't, you know, participating in the military? Or do you think we just weren't explaining the values that they were more inclusive? And the reason I ask you that is, you know, as a Naval Academy graduate, as somebody that follows, you know, elite military units, elite universities, you know, the higher you get to the top, it tends to be less diverse and less inclusive. And so as we start moving forward, I'm just curious to see if do people, do we need to explain the values in a way that are more inclusive or do we need to re-examine the values and make sure people are understanding, not after they get into an institution, but prior to it. So that way if somebody looks at an institution and says, hey, my values align with this place and I think I'll be a good fit as opposed to um, getting them here and then kind of forcing them to adapt? If I, if I understand your question correctly, I, I don't think we had it wrong. I, th I think it was just a matter of evolution. And I, I think it was just over time, um, change is, is going to happen. And I think, you know, you look at women got the right to vote, and so over time, Things, women, and equal opportunity for everybody it has happened. And I think that, um, I don't think we have our, our values wrong. I, duty on our country, I, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves about you know, who we are and what we stand for. And I'm specifically talking about the military right now. But I think that's, that's again, I go back to leadership, and it's important that leaders let those people who are a part of their organization understand the values that you as the leader espouse and as an organization. And so I, I think that we absolutely, ha in the military, have the right values. It's just sometimes we need to reinforce the honor piece because people go astray. And sometimes I found that you have people join the military for maybe the wrong reason and maybe they don't uh, espouse the values that the military does and don't understand why we do the things that we do. Um, and, I, and I had that experience and, and there were people that I said, you know, do you understand this teamwork and, and why we work together and why the rules are what they are? And, why you need to clean up your rack and this, that, and the other. Um, and they just didn't get it. it. It was, you know, not part of their being, and I gave them second and third chances, and, and they just didn't get it. And I said, well, you know, this is not for you because you're a burden on your shipmates, and it's time for you to move on. So I don't think we had the values wrong, and I, I really think that, you know, as time has gone on, Things have opened up for women. We have become more diverse. We have embraced diversity more, and not just for numbers, for demographics, for the right reasons. Because, again, different people with different backgrounds 
bring different things to the table, which is important to any organization for innovation, for creativity, for, you know, for various and sundry. Did I answer the question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. You want me to get out of here?